following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Ladies and gentlemen, today we are going to discuss the different bodies that the Bible talk about. That's why the title of this lecture is Kabbalistic and Alchemical Bodies. With this, we are emphasizing that the Bible is a Kabbalistic and alchemical book that all of us uh, should know how to interpret. To begin, let us understand that Kabbalah is a Hebrew word that uh, derives from the word Kabel, that means to receive. From this point of view, we understand that Kabbalistic bodies are those bodies that we receive according, of course, to the tree of life that we always study. In alchemical bodies are those bodies that we create through the science of alchemy. And we are going to explain in which, in which way we receive, according to the tree of life, bodies, and through alchemy, how we create. In other words, we are approaching, if you can see very clear, that uh, we are entering into the two trees because many times we said that Kabbalah relates to the tree of life and alchemy to the tree of good and evil, which are described in the book of Genesis. So, in this day and age, many Christians, as well as Jewish religious people, talk about uh, the way in which they are going to resurrect and to be uh, in a new order of things after what they call resurrection. Of course, interpreting some of them, the Bible and all the doctrines of the prophets according to their beliefs. And here we are going to explain uh, about that since in the last lecture that we talked in relation with the Bible, we explained about the mystery of Abraham, which is the innermost inside of us. So with this lecture, we are going to penetrate deeper into this theme Related with Abraham, but for that we have to explain according to the tree of life 
in alchemy. About these uh, bodies that the master Hilarion IX talk about. The master Hilarion IX is named in the Gospels, in the Bible, Paul of Tarsus. Paul of Tarsus, of course, Tarsus is the city where he was born, and Paul is the name that he uh, acquired when he was alive at that time in the Holy Land. But as uh, we taught in many lectures, we always say that each one of us has his inner name. The name that is related to the monad. And the name of the monad of Paul of Tarsus is Hilarion. That's his inner name. Hilarion wrote, as you know, many letters that are uh, included in the New Testament after the four Gospels. And he explained many things, Kabbalistically, that people really do not understand because they are afraid of studying Kabbalah, ignoring that the whole Bible is Kabbalah, because Kabbalah means to receive from God all the doctrine that we are explaining here. So in this first graphic of this lecture, you find in the first triangle of the tree of life, the word uh, epuranius. Epuranius. This word epuranius derived from the word uranos, which in Greek means heaven. But the heaven related to the sephira chokma. Because when we apply the different uh, planets, to the 10 Sephiroth of the Tree of Life, we find that Uranus is related with Chokmah. Uh, sometime in Hebrew they call it Maslot, which is a zodiac. All the 12 constellations of the zodiac. That's why we always state that when we uh, talk about the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 uh, archetypes, that descend from the heaven of Urania, that Urania is, of course, Chokhmah. And that's why Epuranios means of Uranus, of heaven. And this is what uh, uh, Paul of Tarsus explained as we are going to read. But first, I'm going to give you an explanation in order for us to understand the meaning of Epuranios of heaven, of Uranus. And of course, that's why we play, uh, we wrote the word stars next to the left of Keter. Because those stars that the Bible talk always about are related with Uranus, with heaven, the stars, with what we call the heaven of Atziluth the heaven of the Father. Now, in the second triangle of the Tree of Life, we find the other word written by Paul, the Master Hilarion in the Bible, pneumaticos. Pneumaticos. That word pneuma means spirit in Greek. So pneumaticos, relate to the spiritual bodies that, as you know, we always talk about is Chesed and Geburah. Chesed is called the spirit, and Geburah is called the spiritual soul. Beneath is Tifereth. That is that part of the monad, but that is the element that we had to work with, which is the human Soul. Soul in Greek is psyche. But obviously uh, the sun, as you see there in red, relates to the second triangle. 
directly related with TFRS, as we many times talk about. So when we talk about the pneumaticos bodies, we are addressing those bodies related with the world of Bria, world of creation. And below it, we find the third triangle in which we find the bodies called psychicos. The psyche, as I said, relates to the soul. This is how you said soul in Greek. Anima in Latin. So the psychicos bodies relate to the third triangle and, of course, joins the pneumaticos by Tifereth, which we call the human soul or the human psyche. Below it, we find Malkut, the, between parentheses, it says psychicos belong to the world of Yetzirah, a world of formation. And the last one is the world of Asia. When we find those bodies that are named by Paul of Tarsus, Epigeos, which means over the surface of Gaia, the earth. Gaia, the earth, is Malkut. Those epigeos bodies relate to that that we call the protoplasmic bodies, which are lunar, related to the moon. But you find here that Yesod, that is the head or the center of the, the third triangle, is uh, headed by the moon. The moon is precisely ruling Yesod and even Hod. But the moon, as you know, has his positive ray and his negative ray. And that's why uh, we put beneath, to the right, lunar, which means also the moon. But in order to point that these are mechanical elements related to the moon, to the positive and to the negative aspects of the moon, which relates to the wheel of Zamzara, related to Malkut. A wheel in which, you know, relates to evolution and devolution. That's why these bodies epigeos relate to those subtle bodies related <coughs> with the mineral kingdom, plant kingdom, animal kingdom, and humanoid kingdom. In biology, they study these epigeos and only apply it to the plants of certain uh, species of plants and, and animals like insects, because they are, uh, epigeos mean above the surface of Gia, the earth. But uh, we apply this word to those bodies that uh, everybody has in the internal worlds. Because uh, the mechanical bodies that we have called emotion and mind, these are those bodies that everybody has even the animals or the plants. You know very well that when the physical body is tired, we go to bed in order to rest, in order to sleep. So people, animals, plants, go into the eternity, which is the fifth dimension, the astral plane, dressed with the epigeos bodies, which are lunar, that we call protoplasmic which are submitted to the mechanicity of nature. Now, the other word in the right is hoikos. Hoikos, bodies, which also are from the Greek language, which means bodies made of dust, also the earth, terrestrial. In this case, it's only applied to the physicality that we have. So you have to make a difference. The, 
physicality that we have is called hoikos, bodies. And the epigeos are the internal protoplasmic bodies. But both of them are lunar. They evolve and devolve in nature. And we had to make that difference when we enter into the other bodies that Paul called psychicos, pneumaticos, and epuranios. Which, in all translations in the Bible, they translated according to what they understand. Because the translators of the New Testament that was written in Greek were not Gnostics, were not initiates, so therefore, they didn't know anything about this mystery. But Paul of Tarsus, Master Hilarion 9, he knew very well because he was Hebrew. He was a master, a rabbi, that knew the tree of life very well, the Kabbalah. And he was an alchemist. He was not a theorist that was just talking about Kabbalah without practicing it. So therefore, he was also an alchemist. And he was teaching that. Based on that is why he wrote all of this to the Gentiles, meaning the Greeks, that were not Jewish from the blood. But in order to point that even in the Greek language, where also these terms related with these prototypes of uh, the 12 uh, <coughs> tribes or elements that all of us have within. The 12 archetypes. This is archetypes or prototypes, same thing. So you read here, for instance, what he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 41 to 42. He says, There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. That's a beautiful alchemical Kabbalistic statement only understood by those that know Kabbalah and alchemy. Otherwise, it's, it's gone. Mm -hmm. The moon is a third triangle. One is the glory of the moon. One is the glory of the sun, the second triangle. And, uh, and another is the glory of the stars, the third or first triangle of the tree of life. This is how you call it. Uranus. Neuma and Psyche. Those are only the three aspects that he talks. The glory. Or we will say how uh, the light. Right? Because all of these bodies that we are going to talk about relate to the solar force. Because it is written in alchemy that we should transform the moon into sun. And that's the first thing that we start doing here in Yesod, when we know alchemy. Above the tree of life, we find the spiritual absolute sun, which, of course, relates to the same solar energy. But in order to make difference among the initiates that resurrect in different levels, Paul of Tarsus wrote that statement. But I repeat, that only alchemists understand. Otherwise, you fall into mistakes. That people are waiting for what they call the rapture. And it's because they don't interpret what is written by these Kabbalists and alchemists. For instance, when we talk about the Epuranius bodies, we have to go into Buddhism. And to remind you that in Buddhism... These Epuranius bodies are called the Dharmakaya, the Sambhogakaya, and the Dharmakaya, I mean the Nirmanakaya. It's another body also called Adikaya, or body of light. Adi in Sanskrit means light. 
All of those, Adikaya, Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, and Nirmanakaya, relate to the Epuranius bodies. Here, up. Now, the Pneumaticos bodies relate to our own monad. Because we have the monad. We have our spirit. But scarcely we know anything about it. And that, of course, is related with the sun. When we talk about the spuranial bodies, we talk about the cosmo creators. Those bodies that the cosmo creators use, the archangels, in order to engender forces into the lower levels of the tree of life. So to find somebody with Epuranius bodies is very rare. Commonly in the among the initiates we find the bodies the pneumaticos, pneuma, the spirit. And you have, for instance, your inner most, your being, your inner angel, who is your own particular individual pneuma, which is, of course, there waiting for the moment in order to work in the initiation. That pneuma, or inner most, is what we call Abraham. Abraham. Now, Geburah, the spiritual soul, is what we call Isaac. So those are the two bodies related with the pneuma, the spirit. Isaac and Abraham, according to the book of Genesis. We are going to study also that in order for us to understand how Abraham and Isaac work within us. Related with Hoikos, which the Bible calls Ishmael or Ishmael. Also created by Abraham. Because when we investigate any physical body in this physical world, we discover that every single atom of that physicality is alive because it contains a microcosmic monad or particle of chesed that we call, the Bible called Abraham, within. And this is what we call Ishmael or Ishmael, our own physicality, which in Greek is called hoikos. Hmm? But unfortunately, within this hoikos, we have the epigeos, which are those bodies related with animality that all, all of us have, and that uh, relates to the lower level of the fifth dimension, which is hod and etzach, but below, in the world that we call klipoth, shells or hell. Hod is the emotional animality that we have in Klipoth. And Etzach is the mental animality that we have in Klipoth. It's reflected there. And the psyche, the soul, is bottled up within those elements, or epigels. Now the work of alchemy is to create new Hod and new Netzach and Tifereth. That's called alchemy. This is what the Bible called to be born again, which is an alchemical statement. Nobody is being born again just by believing in something. As you are not born here in this physical world just because your mother believes in something. Your mother was pregnant because your father impregnated her in the sexual act. If the physical body was created in that way, it's ludicrous to think that the internal bodies will be created just by believing in the same sexual energy, but in a way that is very hidden. And that we, now we are unveiling for the sake of humanity that is still is waiting for the second coming of the Lord and they don't even have the first coming within themselves of the Lord. And this is what Paul of Tarsus talk about. 
very clear to those that knew at that time Kabbalah and alchemy. But now there's a lot of people that have the Bible in their homes, but they don't know anything about Kabbalah. They don't know anything about alchemy. Therefore, they're lost and interpreting that according to their own whim. That's why you find there that uh, the solar bodies that we talk about, that in the beginning we had to create, are related to the first triangle, or the third, in other words, the psychicos. Because everybody has the hoikos and the epigeos within, lunar bodies. But there is no glory there. As you see, Paul of Tarsus is one is the glory of the sun, another of the moon, and another of, of the stars. The stars, Uranus, or the heaven of Urania. So, by understanding that, we are going to enter now to uh, read what the Master Samael Omve or wrote in the book of Tarot and Kabbalah. He said, All Kabbalists base themselves on the Tarot, and it is necessary for them to comprehend the Tarot and study it deeply. When you say Tarot or Torah, the law is the same thing. The universe was made with the law of numbers, measurements, and weight. Mathematics form the universe, and the numbers become living entities. One who penetrates has said the pure and ineffable world of Abraham. The neuma, the spirit, can verify that in this region, everything is reduced to numbers. This region is incredibly real. In this physical world, we do not see things as they are. We see merely the images of things. But when in Hesed, we can know the amount of atoms that form a table and the amount of karma owned by the planet, owed by the planet, as well as the amount of molecules that function in each organism. He said is a world of mathematics. It is a realistic world. In he said one may believe that one is separated from the reality of the world. Yet one is actually in the reality. In a temple of Hesed, one can know the quantity of people who acquire the realization of their being, and the quantity of those who did not. If one enters a kitchen, one knows the amount of atoms that are in the food that one is going to eat. This is an incredibly realistic world. In the world of Hesed, one knows who is truly a human being. So he said, as you know, is associated with Abraham, the spirit. And the negative aspect of Abraham, the spirit, he said, is Malkut. So Malkut is the very bottom. Because when we talk about the true human being, we said it has seven bodies. The spirit, the spiritual soul, the human soul, the mind, the emotion, the vital body or vital base of our physicality and the physical body. That the Bible called Ishmael. So, that is why we always insist that we have to learn the voice, the language of the spirit, which is our innermost. And the Master explains there in the beginning of the Tarot and Kabbalah, his book, that the language of Hesed is pure mathematics, it's Kabbalah. So if you don't learn the basics of Kabbalah, how do you want to understand the language of your own spirit? 
your, the language of your own God. So this is why people are lost in this day and age. Because they don't like to study Kabbalah. Christians think that the science of Kabbalah is from the devil, is from Satan. Without ignoring that the word Kabbalah is Kabel, to receive. To receive inspiration, light from God, is Kabbalah. And some students of Gnosticism in different areas of the world right now, they avoid the study of Kabbalah. Not because they think that Kabbalah is from the devil, but because they are lazy and think that they can advance by not knowing the basics. But that's why the Master Samael wrote many books of Kabbalah in order for us to understand the language, especially of the Bible. And uh, that's why we see in this uh, graphic of the Tree of Life again, the names given in the Bible to this Pneumaticon or Pneumaticos bodies related with the second triangle of the Tree of Life. And we are going also to talk about the Shekinah, which is the force, the feminine force of God, which is hidden in the different wives of these patriarchs. Sarah, the wife of Abraham, that in the previous lecture we have stated, Brahma and Sarasvati in Hinduism, in Sanskrit, is the same as Abraham and Sarah. Sarasvati or Brahma or Abraham is the same thing. Sarasvati or Sarah is that feminine aspect that Kabbalists call the Shekinah, the feminine glory of God. Isaac, for instance, who is the son of Abraham, maybe Rebecca. And Rebecca means in Hebrew, heifer, mean a feminine cow, right? And here we find that this second triangle is the triangle of the sun. in which all the attributes of Christ, called Krishna, are placed in Isaac, whose uh, wife's name was Rebecca, which is another aspect of the feminine Shekinah that uh, the story of Genesis talks about. But the thing is very interesting to find that Krishna is precisely related to Isaac in that aspect. Because in the spiritual soul, we have the archetypes, the 12 archetypes of Israel that we had to develop. And Krishna has as wife, Radha. That is also called Radhika, like Rebecca. And this Radhika is the is one of the gopis, which are always around Krishna. But Krishna is precisely called, how do you call this uh, individual that is related with cows? No shepherd, it's another word. Cowherd. 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 Meaning that he takes ca uh, uh, care of cows. And first the heifer, which is Rebecca, is also a female cow. So in other words, symbolically, all of those women around Krishna relates to the same meaning. Because he is a herd. Uh, what? Cow herd. Cow herd. You see, cow herd related to many cows, I mean, they are taking care, which take the symbol of women. And we, we wonder why? Because in Hinduism, as well as in many mythologies, Malkut, the physicality, 
is a cow. And the spirit is, of course, the bull. This is always the same. So obviously, thanks to the spiritual force of Isaac or Krishna, he's taking care of the physicality, which is called Radhika or Radha. Of course, in Sanskrit appears a, a fem beautiful female, which is the wife of Krishna. But this is a symbol that we have to understand, that when we as souls pray to our inner being, in order to receive his glory, we are in the attitude of a female that receives, because the female receives. We are receptive. And from that point of view, we are rather receptive in the physical world. And this is how you have to understand. And this is how, what the cow represents in mythology. The physical body. Malkut. And of course, after that, you find that Isaac has two sons. Because it's symbol. Isau and Jacob. Which are, of course, the duality. Below and above. No, Jacob is the one that received the inheritance of Isaac, according to the Bible. And Jacob had four wives. These wives of the patriarchs, whether Abraham or Isaac, especially Jacob, represents the Shekinah, the feminine aspect of God that we have to work with and that we are going to explain. But going ahead, in order not to leave this in the air, we will say that Jacob relates to Yesod. In Yesod is a sexual energy called water in Genesis. When we talk about water, we go into Eden. In many lectures, we have stated that Yesod is Eden, the four dimension, sex, that relates to four waters. The cerebral spinal fluid of men and women and the sexual fluid of both of them are four fluids that Jacob has to work with. And in those four fluids are hidden the power of the name of God, yod Hey, vav Hey, which are the four rivers of Eden. And those four rivers of Eden are the four wives of Jacob. Leah, the one that is above, Rebecca, who is below, and the other uh, maidens of each one of them, which I not recall the names. But the truth is that the four, the 12 children of Israel, these 12 archetypes, came into activity in Yesod, <coughs> thanks, thanks to Jacob who is the one that worked with these four aspects of the water, or four aspects of the Shekinah. Always a female element in the Bible is related to the Shekinah, that is the feminine glory of God. Because God is male-female, and in many lectures we talk about El Ayam, the sea goddess, and El Hayam, the sea god which when we read literally is Elohim, which is a feminine, masculine word that we have to understand. So in alchemy, we have to work with those elements. And we explained in the first lecture how Abraham engenders through Hagar Ishmael. And we will say, all of us, because without the power of the monad of the spirit, this physicality cannot be alive. And we are right now alive, thanks to the spirit, thanks to Abraham. But we were fecundated in Hagar, the slave, meaning the way in which we are slave 
of the laws of nature. But always, even though we were created through fornication, which means we were created through the, through the orgasm, animal spasm, deep down in our inner being, we have our inner must, as any animal has it, as any plant has it, but we have the epigeos bodies within. And the hoikos, which is the physicality that we have. But if we love this knowledge, it's because our inner Abraham wants to enter into the initiation. Because he is the one that enters into the initiation, the innermost, the spirit. And in order to enter into the initiation, he needs Ishmael. The physicality. And this Ishmael means he who listened to God. That is the meaning of this word Ishmael. Ishmael. When I say this, it reminds me that prayer that in Judaism they pray every day. Shema Israel. yod heh vav echad. Oh, that God is one. yod heh is one. And Shema means to listen. And the word Shema is in the, in the word, in the name Ishmael, you see? Shema is Shem and, and, and Mem. Shema, Ishmael, that's why it means he who listened to God. Ishmael. But in order to listen to God, we have to be in chastity. Because... Abraham, who was an initiate, in other words, Abraham, the spirit, who listened to God, which is above him, said to God, I hope Ishmael find grace under your eyes. And God said Abraham, in other words, the upper triangle, said to Abraham, no. Ah, my pact is not going to be with Ishmael. Why? Because he's a son of fornication. He's your son. But the pact will be with Isaac. That is going to be born later. But it is written that when Isaac was going to be born through Sarah, not through Hagar, then uh, God commanded Abraham and all, all of them that were next to his doctrine to be circumcised. This is the, the beginning of the circumcision. So Abraham circumcised himself and Ishmael when Ishmael had 12 years. When you read that literally, or oh, you think, okay... Uh, he took the knife and cut the prepucius of his penis as well as Ishmael and everybody there. That pact is a symbol. That means chastity, to cut the animality, fornication. But Abraham has to do it through Ishmael because we are the physicality of Abraham. We are the physicality of our inner most. If our inner most wants to enter into the initiation or self-realization, he needs the physicality. So Ishmael has to be circumcised too. Meaning, enter into chastity. That's the symbol that Jews... Uh, Muslims and many other religions perform physically. But after receiving the circumcision, they continue fornication. They fornicate with their circumcision. And that's ludicrous. The symbol of that is to transmute, to be in chastity in the sexual act. And that's the meaning. And after that, that circumcision that he experienced with Ishmael, Isaac is born. 
receive is not a coincidence that after the circumcision, Isaac is born. That is telling us that in order for Isaac to be born, he has to be circumcised, meaning chastity. Tantra, transmutation of the sexual energy. Isaac, even though existed physically as a patriarch, he symbolizes that development that we had to create within that son of Abraham and Sarah has to grow in your son up inside. In other words, Isaac grows inside Ishmael. You understand that? In the first initiation of Mayor Mysteries, when the fire of the Shekinah, which is Zara, rises in the spinal column, spinal column of any individual, that is Isaac, is the first initiation in the physicality of what we call Kundalini. That Isaac rises within Ishmael. So Ishmael and Isaac are interrelated. But Ishmael is older. Because the number 12, 12 years that he was circumcised means apostolate in Kabbalah. When do you enter into the apostleship, following the path, then that is growing inside of you. So when we talk about Ishmael and talk about Isaac, we talk about two aspects of the initiate. His physicality and his inner development. Though we cannot separate both. We cannot fall into the mistake as people in this day and they think that Ishmael are the Arabs and Isaac are the Jews and this physicality. No, that's wrong. Arabs, Jews, Buddhists, Christians are Ishmael. It is stated in the Bible that Ishmael had 12 children too, or 12 princes. This is what the Bible says. Those 12 are related to the 12 zodiacal signs, physically speaking. But Isaac is related with the 12 archetypes inside of those that enter into the past. It says the only way in which we can explain the sacrifice of Isaac and how Ishmael was sent, and Sarah says, I don't want my son to be with the son of the slave. This is internal, something that only the initial understands. And that's why Mohammed was born from Ishmael, from the tribe of Ishmael, and also Jesus. All of these humanity that exists in the physic physical world are children of Ishmael. But Ishmael is applied only to those that listen to the word of God. Because Ishmael means to listen to God. And if they follow the path, which is the number 12, the apostleship, eventually Isaac will be born within them. Thanks to their father, who is Abraham. But in this physical world, you know, we have as a mother, Hagar, a slave of the laws of nature. Hagar are those women and men that physically want to have children. Some of them interpret the Bible in the wrong way. They said, if Jacob, Abraham, and Isaac had many wives, so this is how we have to be here, they say. And they uh, preach polygamy, fornication, adultery. But Isaac is not going to be born from polygamy or adultery. Isaac is being born only with Abraham and Zara. This is it. 
two forces. Now, the development of all those forces inside is something that we have to interpret and to understand alchemically, not in order to fall into that mistake and to thinking in the wrong way because the way that is written is in relation with names that in this physical world certain people acquire and inherit. Like the word Jewish, Judaism, the Jews. We think that when the Bible talks about the Jews, they, they are applied to these people that live in the Middle East and in many parts of the world that are called Jewish. No. It's called alchemically something inside of us. Whether we are belonging to that race or not. Another aspect of that, is for, for, for instance, in Hinduism, there are Brahma, Brahmins in Hinduism. That people think that they are the untouchable, the, the, the main ones. Ignoring that the real Brahmin is Abraham, Brahma, inside, that we had to develop. Which is untouchable, because you cannot touch physically, but it's inside of you. Physically, you can touch anybody. Even those that are called untouchables in India. But Abraham, or Brahma, the Brahmin, the real Brahmin, you cannot touch it. You cannot touch my spirit. My physicality, yeah. And this is the same meaning. But if you fall into the mistake of interpreting this literally, and then you will think, oh, the Brahmins in India are special people. They are clean. They are pure. As well as the Jews that, that, that call the chosen people. The Jews, indeed, are the chosen people. But this is inside People that we have to build. And this is what Paul of Tarsus talk about, but people do not understand. Paul of Tarsus says in the chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, verse 39 to 58, he said, All flesh of all flesh is not the same flesh. But there is one kind of flesh of Anthropos, humans. Another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also Epuranios heavenly bodies that have belonged to the first jungle of the tree of life. He belongs saying that. And Epigeos terrestrial bodies buried down into the tree of life below. But the glory of the Epuranios is one, and the glory of the Epigeos is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Those who died psychologically. Those who are dead in their protoplasmic bodies, and his, in their errors, differs in vices. It's not a physical death. <clears throat> it is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a psychical soul, body, it is raised a pneumatic spiritual body. There is a psychic body and there is a pneumatic body. And so it is written, the first anthropos or human, Adam, Harishon is called in, in the Bible, the first Adam was made a living soul. That's called alchemy here. The first outcome of the transmutation of alchemy, when you enter into the path of Abraham initiation, the first Adam that appears is Adam Harishon, or the Anthropos, who was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a giving life spirit. Above it, which is Uranus. These are giving life spirit. 
is called Adam Kadmon, Kabbalistically speaking. It's another man. How be it? That was not first which is pneumaticos, but that which is psychicos, and afterward that which is pneumaticos. You see? Neuma is a spirit and psyche is soul. And we see the tree of life, you understand what he is talking about. First is not the neuma, which is the middle triangle. First is the psyche, which is the triangle beneath us. When you enter into initiation, we enter into the psychicos. So first is that, and the second is pneumaticos. The first man is of the earth, hoikos, earthly. In other words, he who enters into the initiation, transmuting through his corruption and creating something incorrupted, is us. You see? If you acknowledge that all of us here present, physically speaking, are corrupted. If someone here said that is holy, go to heaven. Because in this physical world, all of us are corrupted, degenerate. And this planet is plenty of those people. But if you enter into the path, your corrupted physicality will create the miracle of creating something incorrupted inside. And this is what he says there. From the weakness that we are, because we are weak, physically speaking, we create something very powerful inside. But this is alchemy that we have to learn how, uh, what to do. You see, we have to create. We sown in weakness, it's raising power, etc. And then he says, as is the hoikos, such are also that those that are hoikos. And as the epuranios, such are they also that are epuranios. In other words, when you see my physicality, it's called hoiko. But if you address my inner being, and then I said, Let, just a minute, you are addressing now epuranios of heaven. That's my being. He is in heaven, but I am here. So even though you enter into the path, don't feel special. Because even if you do the work, you still are hoikos, earthly. And this is why we have to understand one thing is the master inside, and another thing is the physicality of the initiates. People used to mistake this, this is a master, and immediately they think that is the physicality, the hoikos. No. The Spuranius is the master inside, not the Hoikos. Hoikos is going to die. All of us, physically speaking, will die sooner or later. That's why Paul of Tarsus continues saying, as and as we have borne the image of the Hoikos, we shall also bear the image of the Epuranius. That image, of course, when you close your eyes, I see you now, and I close my eyes, I see you still there. That image is in me, in me of you. Hoikos. But I also have an image of me, which is physical. That is hoikos. But in the same way that I have this image of me as terrestrial, I also have the image, I also will have, should have, the image of my spirit. But that is not easy. Because remember that Paul of Tarsus talks about the heavenly man and the terrestrial man. But everybody thinks that they have the heavenly man. But this heavenly man has to grow, develop through initiation. As we grow here physically, being hoikos. Now, brothers, you see here, this is what he's wrote. I tell you this, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, and corruption cannot inherit incorruption. 
Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That eye is the pineal gland here. Because when the Bible talks about the eyes of the spirit, it's talking about the pineal and pituitary glands, which are connected to the inner spirit. Because the two eyes that we have here, physical, these are eyes that physically we need in order to know people. But the eyes that it says in the, bl in the twinkling of an eye, what eye he's talking about? It's not a physical eye. It's a pineal eye, which is Bina, the Holy Spirit, that we have to develop through chastity. The last trumpet. We are there, for the seven angels sounded. The seven angel is the seven trumpet that we have to listen here in the seven body. The trumpet shall sound, and the dead psychologically speaking, shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put, in, put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And the book of Revelation says, And there were great voice in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Hmm? This is something that we have to gain. That twinkling of an eye, the evangelists all over the world, they think that in the twinkle of a physical eye, they will be raptured and taken into heaven. And Paul says, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. This corrupted body that was born through fornication cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The only one that can inherit the kingdom of God is Isaac. But we have to create it inside. And this is precisely alchemy. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Or death, where is thy sting? Or grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our inner Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The Lord is Spuranius. Up, you see, Chokhmah. The second man is Chokhmah, the Lord from heaven. And this is what we have to learn. So Paul of Tarsus talk about all, all of these bodies that we are talking here in the tree of life. But the translation that the people do or did of those are really ludicrous. And it's because they don't know about. Paul of Tarsus also said, Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a divine promise. Chastity. Now, this must be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and birth children who are not, which, which are to be slaves. In other words, we. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem. 
because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, you see, like Isaac, are children of promise. And at that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. By what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave of the woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Both women are inside. If we follow fornication, we are creating through Hagar. If we learn alchemy and transmute the sexual energy, we follow Sarah, which are the two aspects of the Divine Mother. When we talk about the Divine Mother, Master Samael says, the two aspects of the Divine Mother in a negative way is Lilith and Nahema. Lilith is a mother of, of uh, sexual abuse, homosexuality, lesbianism, uh, pedophilia, is how it, right? Pedophilia. And many other degenerations that are very abundant and very common in this day and age. And Nahemad, or Nahemad, is a mother of adultery and prostitution. In other words, all that, all those elements, Lilith and Nahemad, are within. If we follow that, we are children of the slave woman. Because the slave woman is submitted to the law of evolution, devolution. Evolution, devolution. And everything in this physical world are submitted to the law of evolution and devolution. Even religions, as you know, they evolve and devolve. So those people, of course, in Jerusalem and in all parts of the world, in this physical world, are children of the slave. In Judaism, they follow uh, many traditions. Traditions are related to the world of Samzara. The Four Seasons, too. Reoccurrence. And they say, for instance, I remember a, a long time ago, a Jew, I gave him the perfect matrimony to read. And he gladly read it. And after that, he called me and said, you know, in our religion, we know all of this. And I said, yeah, I know that. You practice it? Well, let me tell you, between you and me, I only fornicate every Friday. I said, all right, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's good, you know. But it's still you fornicate. You know what I mean? You multiply every Friday because you want to have children, like in other religions, uh, in Christianity. You know, they follow, especially here, called the Mormons. They want to have a lot of children. Because they said that in the future, when they die, they will reunite in eternity with their wives and children. That is interpreting everything literally. Yeah, after death, physical death, we reunite in eternity, the fifth dimension. But in Klippoth, and all of that that we made, because Klippoth is eternity, the fifth dimension, which has a beginning and the end, and an ending, you know. It's not uh, an eternal time that many people think, because time is a circle. And eternity is another circle. It has a, its beginning and its, and its ending. So, if we create through fornication, even if we know the doctrine of Kabbalah and alchemy, we are children of the slave. 
And we follow in Christianity many traditions. Christmas, Easter, nice, right? In Judaism as well, in Islam as well. But all of them fornicate. They are not creating inside Isaac. But they think that they will resurrect. Paul of Tarsus, that's why he had many enemies at that time, 2,000 years ago. When he was following the path of Christianity. Or the Messiah. The fornicators didn't like that. We don't want this Messiah to say that we have to transmute and have no children. You know? So therefore they wanted to lynch also Paul. At the end, I think they killed him. Because he was telling them, uh, according to Kabbalah, what we are teaching here. Flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's not resurrection. For a flesh and blood that is corrupted like us. This flesh and blood has to be annihilated, has to be destroyed. But before being destroyed, we had to take advantage of this corruption and to create to alchemy that which is not corrupted. Isaac, you see? That's why Paul says it's a mystery. From the incorrupted body, we create something that is not corrupted. And we learn how to do it. Now, when we go into the Bible, <coughs> we find what Paul of Tarsus is talking about. We are children of the Jerusalem above, not the Jerusalem below, which is in slavery. And then you ask, what, there are two Jerusalems? Yeah, there are two Jerusalems. The Jerusalem from above, of the heavenly Jerusalem, has to be created through alchemy. And this is possible to create when we know the mystery. And this is the, you find here, the symbol of uh, the heavenly Jerusalem. Because the terrestrial Jerusalem is there. Uh, uh, Arabs or Muslims, Jews are fighting, even Christians. Because they think that the Lord will descend there. Physically speaking. Not comprehended. The, the, the Lord, Chochma, Spuranios, from heaven will descend only in Tifereth. This is what Sahariah said. And his feet will stand in that day upon Tifereth, the Mount of the Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. If you know Kabbalah, you know that the east is Tifereth. And you know that the three mounts upon which Jerusalem is built, alchemically, Kabbalistically speaking, are the three uh, pneumaticos bodies called Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But in those regions of the spirit, they're called the Mount Golgotha or Golgotha, the Mount of the Skull, called in Latin Calvary, which is the same. Mount of Moria or Mount Moria is Geburah. You will ask, because there are many people that want to know about Moria. Well, Moria is a master. And that, mo that master is from Geburah, the ray of Mars. He's a master of the strength, of power. So when you said Mount Moria, oh yeah, Geburah. Because even the master that has that name is from the ray of strength. Of course. Physically speaking, you find in the Middle East, in Jerusalem, Moria, Golgotha, and the Mount of the Olives. But this is the way how alchemists and Kabbalists hide things in order for the profane not to see it, what they should see. But now we are unveiling it in order for you to see, in order not to follow that mistake, because we are in the time of the end, and we have permission to talk clearly. So the new, the new Jerusalem, or the heaven in Jerusalem, is built 
on top of these three months, Chesed, Gebura, and Tifereth, Golgotha, Moria, and the Mount of Olives. If you say, well, there's seven hills according to the Bible, well, count the other four sephirot below, and then you find the other hills. Netzach, Chod, Yesod, and Malkut. This is how, from the very bottom to the top, you build Jerusalem up there. Archimedes speaking. Don't fall into the mistake of wanting to create another temple here with bricks. Because we're trying in order to establish the capital of Judaism in Jerusalem. But this will be the capital of Ishmael. Because the true Jews are inside, are heavenly, above, children of Sarah in Abraham. That's why in Chronicles chapter 3 verse 1 is written, And Solomon began to build the house of yod heh vav -Hey, Jehovah, in Jerusalem, in Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is precisely where Jehovah, yod heh vav -Hey, said to Abraham. You see, this is yod heh vav -Hey Elohim. Bina, in the left side of the tree of life. Yod Hebabah Elohim said to Abraham, Go to Mount Moriah, which are three days of journey. One, two, three. This is the fourth, right? Chod, Yasot, Ankut. From the very bottom, he has to descend to Hagar, Malkut, and to go up to Yesod, to Hod, and then to Gebura, which is Mount Moria. And sacrifice your child to me. Sacrifice of fire. Sacrifice of fire. Gebura is fire. Hesed is water. Tifereth is air. If you don't know Kabbalah, if you don't know alchemy, you think that physically Abraham was taking Isaac in order to kill him. In that mount there in the Middle East, which is uh, close to the Mediterranean Sea. Which is written that way in order to confuse those that are unworthy. Right now, you are also, we are also unworthy. But we have to clarify this in order to understand. Otherwise, we, we do not comprehend. The Arabs or the Muslims says, no, 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 no. The one that we want to be sacrificed was Ishmael, not Isaac. Because we are descendants from Ishmael. When the Jews said, no, it was Isaac, according to the Bible. But our other scripture says that was Ishmael. Hmm? And both were children of Abraham. Right? And they were going to be killed? Where? In Mount Moria. Who was right and who was wrong? You might ask. The answer is, both of them are right and both of them are wrong. Because Ishmael was going to be sacrificed and also Isaac, both of them. But there are two children here. And this is only one, your only son, right? But if you understand alchemy and understand the path of initiation, you understand that your physicality is Ishmael, he who listened to God. And you understand Kabbalah, you say, you have to say that they are, they are the one that is created within you to transmutation, thanks to Abraham and Sarah, is Isaac within you. So the initiate, the alchemist, is Ishmael physically and is Isaac spiritually. The same being. So both of them were going to be sacrificed. And this is precisely the mystery. How? In the first initiation of major mysteries, when the 
physical body became chaste with transmutation, Isaac is born in our physicality. Isaac is born within Ishmael. And that fire that rises in the spinal medulla of the physical body is the sword that Abraham has said receives internally. Anyone who receives the first initiation of major mystery receives the sword of fire. So any master of the White Lodge, who is the master of the first initiation of major ministers, has a sword of fire in his right side. And all angels have it. That fire is a fire that rises. As those, uh, how you call the Buddhists from Japan? Samurais. Samurais that take the sword from back because this is where the sword comes. From the medulla, the spinal, from here. So, Yahweh Elohim said to Abraham, go and give me your son and sacrifice in the Mount Moria. And of course, above the Mount Moria, in the left column of the Tree of Life, is Bina, whose name is Yahweh Elohim, or yod he vav -He elohim the Creator. Shiva, according to Hinduism. Go there and give your son to me. But the values that you work in your physicality are not going to be there. That's a sacrifice. Isaac was born in your physicality. But now God says, no, 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 no. I know your physicality. There you have your protoplasmic bodies and all the dirt. I don't want that for Isaac because if Isaac remains there. It's going to be polluted. This incorruption has to be given to me. Give me your son in the Mount Moria. In other words, through the fire, raise this Isaac that was born in the physical world up to Geburah. And all of us Gnostics know very well that in the first initiation of Mayor Mysteries, Geburah, the spiritual soul, absorbs the values that we gain in the physical world. They don't remain in the physical world because those values belong to the spirit. It will be a great mistake if those values remain in the physical body. Imagine people that developed chakras and powers here in a negative manner called sorcerers, witches, etc. They do evil with those powers because they have the ego alive. And Abraham, our inner most, knows very well if we leave those spiritual values in the physical body, this egotistical Ishmael is going to use it in the wrong way. So, therefore, Isaac had to be sacrificed and Ishmael too. The two of them are sacrificed. They are taken out. Abraham takes Isaac, the spiritual fiery, fire blood, uh, values from the physicality to Geburah, to the Mount Moria. And he thinks that he has to cut the union <laughs> of those values. In other words, the Antakaran Accord. Many pictures of Abraham they see with a knife or with a sword going to sacrifice or, or I mean to slaughter the son. Because this is the, how the people, ignorant people did it in the past. But no, the sacrifice is this. He takes the sword and cuts the silver cord. In order to remain this Isaac in Mount Moria and Ishmael here. And Ishmael will remain with those, without those values. You see, Ishmael and Isaac are the same. Isaac is in the spinal column, in what we call the spiritual womb. That's the son of our sacrifices, of our chastity. And the physicality is that body that our mother and father gave us through fornication, through Hagar. Now God says, don't leave Isaac there. 
take it to Moria and give it to me. He's above in Binah. And when he is there, he says, wait, Abraham. I know that you fear me. And you brought your son here to Mount Moria to give it to, to me. People think that he's not going to sacrifice. He's already there. He's already taken. But don't cut the silver cord. Don't do that death. Because if the silver cord is cut, then physically Ishmael dies here. I mean, the physicality dies. But then an angel holds his hand and says, no, don't do it. Because now they are separated. Isaac is in Geburah, in Mount Moria, while Ishmael is in the physical world. They are united. But Isaac is not longer in the physical world. After that sacrifice, Isaac belongs to Geburah. He's in Mount Moria forever. Those spiritual values are there. And Abraham returns. He says, with Isaac to Hagar or to Jerusalem, in the physical world, to Malkut. Because he didn't cut the silver cord. So there was a sacrifice. If you observe, there is a double sacrifice. Ishmael is sacrificed and Isaac is sacrificed because they are separated. Of course, the Bible talks about that separation in the following steps. How Isaac continued the development of the spiritual man within. While Ishmael just go there, physically speaking, and try to survive in this jungle of brick and steel in which we live. Making money, many things because we had to eat, we had to have a shelter, we had to how many things we had to survive in this physical world. That's all the equation that we had to, to resolve. The first part of the equation is to survive in this jungle in which we, all of us, are born. Any country. The second part of the equation is that we always plenty here. To develop in, his, in the initiation, Isaac, Jacob, and all the tribes or archetypes of Israel within. And that's precisely the, the point here. So when you see the sacrifice of Abraham and Isaac, it's an initiatic path. In the physical world, commonly, the initiate suffers a terrible sickness. Physically, he is very close to death. And when we investigate that initiate, what is going on? Why is he going close to, to death? We discover that internally, he is passing that ordeal of the first initiation of mere mysteries, in which his inner values, spiritual values that he acquired physically by chastity, are going to be separated and sent into the Mount Moria, Mount of Geburah. And in that process, he's very close to death. Very close, but never dies. And when he recuperates his health, he says, finally, his inner values were taken from him, and he's alive. And now he has to continue in his path, developing the spiritual values of Geburah through Jacob. And there's another step in which the initiate had to descend into Yesad. But let us, before explaining that, go on into another graphic in order to you to explain. In the book of Genesis, you find this statement in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. He says, states, These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth. Behi baram. Meaning, when they were created. In the day that 
Yahová Elohim, Bina, made the earth and the heavens. In the Zohar it states, Behibaram is an anagram of B. Abraham, meaning by Abraham. The creation was brought about by the trans transposing of the letters of the concealing word, bara into abar, the sacred principle of which the word was found dead and continues to subsist. Me, who was the first aspect of the mysterious unknown, who when bara was transposed into abar, created ele, this to abar or aber he took and joined the letter h forming abrach to ele this he took and joined the letter yod forming elehi my god then of the two component letters of me he took and added mem the letter mem to each of them, and thus were formed Elohim and Abraham. You see, this is the living letters with numbers explaining what this chapter of Genesis says. Another explanation of the forming of this name is as follows. The Holy One took me and joined it to Ele. And this form Elohim. He also took Ma, what? And joining it to Aber, forming Abraham. So, Abra means to create. That's why when you said Behibaram is created by Abraham. In other words, what this chapter of Genesis explains alchemically is telling us that our inner most, Abraham, have to create the heavens and the earth. When they were created by Bina, the earth and the heavens. Do you, do you see very clear there? Of course, the, in the Zohar, this Kabbalist state all of this that you have to study and read in order to comprehend it because I know it's not easy when you are not accustomed to read Kabbalah and alchemy. But it is very clear that the Zohar states that Abraham made the heavens and the earth and also explains that Jehovah Elohim made the earth and the heavens, both of them. And this is only understandable when you comprehend that Jehovah Elohim, the left column, is from where Abraham emerges. From the Espuranios bares, or Epuranios, it's called Epuranios, which is the Holy Spirit. Is one of these bodies which are very heavenly. The giving life and spirit of the Cosmo Creator have the power to create the innermost within us. So each one of us has his innermost, his inner being, his Abraham, who is the son of the first triangle. But without the intervention of this Abraham, we cannot create anything within because it's our innermost, our spirit. We have stated in other lectures that the throne of Abraham, the throne of God, the throne of the Holy Spirit is the central nervous system. So in the central nervous system, which is the spinal medulla and the brain, is where the spirit sets or sits in order to start creating within us, in the spinal medulla. And this medulla and brain are united to the first triangle. How do we see that in us? 
we have three brains. Intellectual brain, in the head, emotional brain, in the heart, and the sexual motor instinctual brain in the area of our genitals. Those are the three brains related with Keter, Hohma, Bina, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is how the Christian science in Catholicism, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those are the three forces in our physicality. People say, I don't believe in the Trinity. Then, then you don't believe in yourself. Because you are a Trinity. Three-centered being. Thoughts, feelings, and actions. This is a Trinity. Three forces in one. And if your central nervous system, your spinal medulla, you have seven chakras, seven centers, seven magnetic centers that people study as seven chakras. Those are related to the lo lower sephiroth. Or to the seven bodies that you call from Abraham to Hesed, or Hesed to Geburah to Tifereth, to Netzach, to Chod, to Yesod, and to Malkut. Those are the seven magnetic centers here. That's why it's called the throne of the spirit. Because Hesed, Abraham, is the spirit that has to control the lower six sephiroth below. Thanks if he, the spirit, makes a balance of the three brains. That's why we always work with the three brains. Thoughts, feelings, and actions. And when we are doing that, we have to remember God. To remember Abraham. To remember the inner must. Help me to balance my three brains. Because you have to sit in my spinal column, the central nervous system. That's your throne. That God gave you. But God in my three brains right now is not balanced. Because of those errors, vices that we have within. So you see that? And in order for us to comprehend about that trinity... Here you find that when Abraham is going to enter into the initiation, three men, he says, appear to him in Genesis chapter 18, 1 to 5. It's written, and Yodhev of Hay appeared to Abraham by the ox of Mamre as he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, and he lifted up his eyes and looked. And lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself towards the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, Pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet. And rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye. Your hearts after that ye shall pass on, for therefore are ye come to your servant. You see that he's talking, my Lord, in singular. He's not talking in plural there. And how come three men? But this is a symbol of Keter Chokmah Binah, because after that triangle, the immediate Sephirah that appears is Hesed, which is Abraham. So Abraham is a spirit, which is precisely in the this says, in the ox of Mamre. That exists in the physical world, but that means that area of the tree of life. Which is here. In that. These three men are Keter, Choma, Vina, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which are coming to him. That's why he says, my Lord, because he understands that these three forces 
or a Puranius bodies, if you want, and if we can use now the word Epuranius, heavenly bodies from the first triangle are put into him because he emanated from it. He says, my Lord, one. As you understand that you have three brains, thoughts, feelings, and actions, but you are one physical body. The same with God. It is written there that uh, these three men are going to go to Sodom and go more to destroy it. We talk about it in another lecture. But he says, if you find, find uh, 50 just people, are you going to destroy them? No, if I find 50, no. Gebura. If you find 45, are you going to destroy them? No, if I find 45, no, I won't. If you find 40, it's, uh, are you going to destroy them? No. If I find 40, I won't destroy them. Just a minute. If you find 30, hold. Will you destroy it? No. If I find 40, I won't destroy them. If, I, if you find 20, are you going to destroy it? No. I won't, find, I won't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for 20. Just. But if you find 10, Malkut. You see? This is the sequence, Kabbalistically, from Abraham down to Malkut. And the Lord says, no, if I find 10, I won't destroy them. 10 just mean ch chase people that is transmuting the sexual energy, that is, are in chastity, that are following the path of, of the spirit. If these three forces descend to New York, you, <laughs> you won't find any. You know what I mean? Like in Sodom, because sodomy... It's very common now. They preach it. So therefore, this is the sequence. The three primary forces destroy the people that are really not good. Polluted seeds. God wants to find something good. It initiates from Geburah, or from Tifereth, from Netzah, from Horon. You thought, okay, just initiate from Malkut, for God's sake. If you find 10, he said, no, I won't destroy them. When he got, go there, he finds Lot, the only one. Lot means hidden. Means the doctrine is hidden, still there in Sodom, but nobody is carrying that. Lot has it, but nobody is unveiling it. That the word Lot in Hebrew means hidden, hide. But now here we are unveiling Lot, the, what is hidden. But maybe in the future those forces come because the three forces create and also destroy. If they descend from above from Epuranius down to Hoikos to find how many people are doing the work, you know, this is how the world, the world descends, the forces. But they descend through the three brains because all of that is within us. It's not outside, it's within. And if he doesn't find, well, like Sodom and Gabor, we will be destroyed. Now, what Abraham creates through the power of Elohim is precisely that symbol that we find of uh, Blake, William Blake. Elohim created, creating Adam inside. But now, we are going to talk about that in order for you to understand what is an idol. The meaning of that is up there and explain that idol comes from the Greek eidolon. In Gnosticism, we call the eidolon the astral body. But idol means also, as you see there, image, mental or physical form from Greek, eidolon, appearance, reflection of oneself in water or a mirror. 
also mental image, apparition, phantom. Eidolon also means any material image, statue, from eidos, form, from Latinized form of Greek, oides, from eidos, form, related to eidain, to identify, el denai, literally, to identify, to recognize mental perception. That is what idol means, an image. Now we place to the left in blue, and Elohim said, let us make Adam in our image after our likeness. And Yod Hava Elohim formed men of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. A living image? You might say that God was creating an idol in very clear English, he was creating an idol. Because that is what the image means. So people say, let us not worship idols. But God created an idol. And that idol is Adam. An image. But into the image of him. So the commandment that is written in the Bible... You shall not worship any image, meaning any image that is not created by him. Do you understand that? Close your eyes and observe yourselves within and see how many images do you have of yourselves. People believe themselves to be holy. People believe to be themselves chosen. People believe themselves in different ways, many, many things. Those are false idols, false images. But in this lecture, what we are teaching here is to create that image of God. And for that, only God can create it. That's why Abraham, who is the son of God, can create through us Isaac, Jacob, and those bring the, what we call the Tzalem, the image of God within. And that's precisely the commandment. It's not what the people think. Oh, I believe only in one God. I don't know where that God is, but I believe in him. And they said, and I don't worship idols. But they call idols statues. Because the meaning of idol is also that, a statual form. But the Bible talks that God made Adam of clay, they say, of the dust of the earth, with clay. So what then? We are idols? Each one of us are idols? No. We are false idols. And that's another thing. And this is what the commandment states. You shall not worship false idols within because if you observe in meditation all what you have within your psyche you will see all of those false idols those Isaac is within you which Abraham made into the image according to the commandments of Yod Chava Elohim those Isaac is within you if Isaac is not within you then you have a false idol an image, a thought, a belief. Oh, I am Christian. That's why I'm going to be saved, because I believe in what is the Bible said. Or any other book. Interpreting things literally. Believing, you say, in what the Bible says. Or what the Quran says. Or what the Sutra says. And many other writings which are holy, which teach the same thing. And this is the meaning of you shall not worship idols. Symbols in many religions of these archetypes exist. Tankas, for instance, as you see here, symbolizing archetypes that exist that you should only comprehend. And also here you find 
in Catholicism, you find a lot of statues of saints, whatever, because are symbols of archetypes. Like the three pratyaks that we are talking about here. Whether you believe them or not, it's, it's not the point. You have not created any false image. It is, the commandment says, above in heaven, or in the earth, or beneath the earth, or in, under the sea. But that is alchemical statements. Not that you don't have to, it doesn't say, don't believe in idols. It says, don't create, don't make. And this is the point. If you are a fornicator, you are making a lot of idols, a lot. And you have it within. And we end the lecture here because you might have questions and still there is another graphic, but let us, you know, well, we talk about this already. Uh, let us explain about this when, when Abraham is doing that. Why? Uh, I put this graphic there. Why uh, Isaac had to be sacrificed or absorbed by Geburah in the Mount Moria? Why? Because Jesus says, No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment that you're creating, which is pure inside, and uses it to patch an old garment, your corrupted physicality. For then the new garment will be ruined and the new patch won't even match the old garment. You see? That's why that's, a, that's sacrifice. And then he says, And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. For the new wine will burst the wineskins, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine must be stored in new white skins. But no one who drinks the old wine seems to want the new wine. These people, the old is just fine, they say. This is what the people, when we project, no, 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 we are good with our traditions. And according to our traditions, we are going to be uh, taken in a rapture. Or we are going to be resurrected in, the, in eternity. And we will be in heaven. God will give us a planet in order for us to populate it with all the children that we created. Is the people believe that. You know? In other words, I will make you a cosmo creator just by believing in me. Right? Easy. But that is the meaning of why that sacrifice of Abraham. Hmm? Because the new wine is that that you build inside. And if you mix it with your old stuff that you have here, you ruin it. You create an abortion. A hasnamus. You have like, uh, questions? You mean that, that, that if you believe in, in that God that if you pray to it, it says, please don't destroy us? No, I mean, like, you know, when you, when you, when you fall in love with your, a significant other, like a girlfriend or boyfriend, yeah. and you start to perceive them in, in a certain way representing a type of perfection or a representative love from God that, you know, that it won't hurt, you know, that, it, that, that you treat them as if they're, like almost if they're some type of divine entity. Is that kind of like turn them into an idol in place of God? Well, there are many ways in order to make idols. If you see, the easy way is to watch uh, every other, I don't know which day is, American Idol. <laughs> you see? And the people are making an idol of somebody else and because he sings very well. Yeah, he sings, uh, and his appearance is very, very handsome, young, whatever. So they make an idol of, of him. But uh, people that do that also make, have idols with him. There are people that don't watch American Idol. And uh, in other countries, they are imitating those programs and trying to follow the American way. 
right? But the idol really is within. Of course, also you can uh, uh, idolize your, uh, your wife, your, your girlfriend, and to have a, an image of her, which usually everybody does that. Sometimes you have dreams. You have uh, your wife or you have your, uh, your, girlfriend. your girlfriend or a friend, whatever, and then she appears there and seduces you. <laughs> and then you fall, you fornicate with her. And then in the physical world, you are angry. That you make me fall in every... No. <laughs> it's, your, it's your own image. You created that. I don't deny that that person can come also. Because they are the uh, female black magicians that are sent by the, white, the black lodge in order to make those people that are trying to be chased to fall. It is that. But most of the falls that uh, people have, sexually speaking, are because of the images that they created, those idols. They idolize lust. They idolized pride, vanity, and that's why we are entangled in, in the world of idols. We have to destroy them. But this is something psychological. It's not that, oh, because I believe in Jesus, this idol will disappear. No. There are many people, millions, that believe in Jesus, and they have a lot of idols within. And outside, too. The worst thing is to worship your own idols, your own self, in other words, and to worship the, the other selves, other idols that people created. You know, that's why we have to, to understand this, uh, this doctrine. The only way in order not to worship idols is by destroying the red demons of Seth, our errors, our defects, the unbelievers. We have to destroy them inside. Those are the egos. They don't care about this doctrine. The ego just want to satisfy themselves. In, this is it. Yeah. But we have to follow Abraham, Isaac. That's just the beginning. Malkut. Make that sacrifice. A great sacrifice. And people say that's the sacrifice of faith. To take your faith. Oh yeah. And you had to have because after in the first initiation when you build all of that within, you are enjoying clairvoyance, clairaudience, and uh, many things that that fire in the spinal column of the physical body gives you. And all of a sudden, poof, you don't have it. What happened? I'm falling? No. What's taken from you? Because you are still filthy. And I lay your ego and maybe you will enjoy them. But right now, they're sacrificing the Mount Moria. Because that good wine has to be taken from you. If you want to enjoy that good wine, well, annihilate your ego. And then that wine will pour in you. But you have to dress with a new garment. And that's only the beginning. After that follows other, uh, other steps that I was going to talk to you, but I don't think so. Maybe next time. Yeah? Could you go back to the slide with where you talked about, you mentioned the first Adam and then the Adam Cosmos? That one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you said the first Adam was related to spirit, to breath, to breath. <coughs> what the Bible called the first Adam, or in Kabbalah called the first, which is Adam Harishon. It's the first Adam that emerges when you create astral, mental, and causal bodies. That is Adam Harishon, or a master of major mysteries. But Adam Kadmon, the second Adam, is different. He's a Lord from Uranus. In other words, it's Chokhmah that descend in Adam Harishon, the first Adam, in Tiferet, where it's explained that he has his feet there. That's the incarnation of Christ, because Chokhmah is wisdom, is, is the Christ, the cosmic Christ that descends and make of that union with Adam Harishon, what the Bible calls in the New Testament, the Son of Man. So the Son of Man is a mixture of Uranus with the earth. When you see somebody that is following the direct path, then you see his physicality. 
that we call hoikos, right? The earth. But the internal man, the spiritual man, is the son of man, which is in Tifereth, a union of Chokmah, the Lord, the Christ, with the human soul. He enters there in order to transform that Adam Harishon into Adam Katmon. This is a transformation of alchemy. That's the second coming. This is pure alchemy. And no one uh, reaches those heights if first is not creating. I mean, the first step, as we show here, is the creation of Isaac. That's the first. Don't worry about Ishmael, because Ishmael is here. Listen to this lecture. He who listened to the word of God, right? We are Ishmael. But have to part for a, a great transformation. Another question. Well, I, uh, yeah? So you mentioned Jacob is related with Tifereth. Yeah. And then you also said he's related with uh, Yasad. This uh, relation of uh, Jacob with Tifereth and with Yasad will be explained in the next lecture because it's very Kabbalistic and very long. I thought I was going to, I said, I, I want to kill many birds with one shot. And I only reach Isaac, but still now the Isaac has to develop. And Jacob and all of that is, is written there. So we are going to continue that in the next lecture, uh, which is not next Saturday. It's who knows when. You will know. Can you explain why in the Tree of Life you had the fifth dimension in the, the Kopat and the fifth dimension in the... Well, <clears throat> fifth dimension, eternity, is related with two bodies or two sephirah, sephiroth, Hod and Etzach, because Yasad belongs to the fourth dimension. Now, the bodies that we were talking about in the first image, the epigeos, epigeas bodies, relate to the world of eternity. They belong to eternity. That's why we have stated that the, those bodies are created when we were mineral. And then when we were plants, they were evolving, and then animals, and then finally humanoids. That evolving of those epigeos bodies or protoplasmic bodies happens in the fifth dimension. This is what we call the elementals of nature. They develop there at a certain point. And after that, they devolve and fall into hell. They evolve in the surface of the earth. You see the surface. Because this is what epigeos means. Above the surface of Gia, the earth. But they devolve in Klipoth always in the fifth dimension and are disintegrated here and belong to eternity because this is what uh, Gnostically speaking we call the fourth dimension is time related to Yesad. Time is a circle, has a beginning and the end. That's why we enter into the circle of time and in that circle, we create the hoikos body, which is this terrestrial physical body that we have. That is a hoikos body, created in time. We're born in time, and eventually we will die in time and return into eternity. Now, eternity is another circle. It is not... Uh, let me drink a little bit of water here. It is not a straight line that people think. Eternity begins here and ends nowhere. It's always there. No, no. 
Eternity is another circle beyond time. We enter into that circle every time that we die physically. And according to the law of reoccurrence or, or return, or people call it reincarnation, we return to a new body. So eternity spit us out. And we fall into time. That's 108 times. But every time that we die physically, we return into eternity. And that's the circle, you see? The beginning and the end. But when we finish the 108 lives that give us opportunity in this physical world to do what we are explaining here, when we said there, we don't believe in that, we don't want that, etc. And this is it. I just continue believing why I believe in this is it. Okay, you finish your 108 times, and then eternity swallows you. You have no more times or more opportunities into the circle of time, and then you enter into Klippoth. And that eternity, you will, or your bodies, your epigeos bodies, will be disintegrated in eternity. But has a beginning and an end. When the bodies are disintegrated, that eternity, that circle, ends. It's not like people that do not know Kabbalah and alchemy think. If you enter into hell, it will be forever. That will be unjust. To create klipas, hell, in order for those that don't do the work to be there forever, that will be, come on. It's a tyrant there. No. It's called forever or eternity is because it is in the fifth dimension, which is eternity. And it has a beginning and the end. And after that, the soul emerges without defects, without errors, from Kripoth again into the surface to start another cycle, which will be in time, out of eternity. Yeah? So you, you started out by saying that the elemental Oh yeah. Um, is, can you talk about the relationship between that and if you go, if you finish your 108 lives, and then all of your, all of your, your defects, your egos, and, and your own epigeos gets, gets, uh, you know, destroyed within Kippoth? Is there a relationship between those two, the elementals and um, our own bodies and our own psyche? Yeah. Uh, the, those epigeos bodies are what we call the protoplasmic bodies, the emotion and the thought, in we, within which the psyche, the soul, is bottled up, trapped. Right? We evolve in, over the surface of Malkut, and those are they're called the elementals, gnomes and pygmies, sylphs and sylphs of the air, or all those uh, elementals there in the plant kingdom, in the animal kingdom, in the humanoid kingdom. The human kingdom is us. We are humanoids, no human beings. In order to belong to the human being kingdom, we had to create the beginning of that creation is Isaac. And that following the sequence that the Bible talks about. If we don't do that, though and then those epigeos bodies eventually will be destroyed because they, they degenerate. They become gross. If you see the epigeos, for instance, in the animals, the irrational animals, they still are beautiful elementals that uh, do not know anything about good and evil, and they still enjoy happiness. But as soon as those animals enter into the human kingdom and gain the intellect, reasoning, they start devolving because we use the intellect in order to do only evil. Our epigeos bodies right now are monsters, are really terrible elements. We, we look like monsters in comparison with the animals. If we, compare, if we compare, for instance, a lion, the epigeos bodies of a lion, and we see it clairvoyantly, those bodies are beautiful. His level of being of that lion is very high. And if we observe the most 
we will call intelligent intellectual in this world and compare it, those epigeos bodies with that intellectual humanoid with the lion, we will see that it's no comparison. He has monsters with him. Intellect, epigeos bodies that believe or don't believe in God, and they think that they are superior. But if we put that humanoid in front of a lion, we will see who is superior. Who do you think? The lion. But we think we are superior. And that's why we invent weapons of mass destruction. This is the common saying in this day and age, right? Because we are afraid. We are weak. But Paul of Tarsus says, from that weakness, we can create something powerful. If we enter into chastity. Animals cannot do it. I mean, the irrational animals. Because they don't have intellect or reasoning. They fornicate. But they are not blamed because they don't know. But we know. We have the scriptures, many scriptures, different parts of the world. If you want to enter, go out of this circle of vicious circle of evolution and evolution, well, enter into the kingdom of the human being. And you are here because you want to enter. Well, there are the books, you know the path. All depends of your Abraham. Because you are weak. So don't forget God. Remember yourself. Remember God always. Otherwise, your destiny will be down. Because the epigeos bodies belong to nature. Even the hoikos bodies belong to nature. What happened to the hoikos body, the terrestrial body that we have, when it's old and dies? It goes to the to the grave, the center grave, because we turn to nature. The epigeos bodies also belong to nature, but in the eternity, in the fifth dimension. She will destroy them. But we have to be born again in order to not to have that luck. Another question. Yeah. Is that related to Abraxas and also to the, to the magical, you know, incantation abracadabra? The yeah. Root. Exactly. The same root of abracadabra and Abraxas. Yeah, same root. Creation. Those are powerful words that hide mysteries, right? But uh, in the Bible, which is the book to, that really shows us all the way, is where we find all of these... Uh, archetypes that show us how, what to follow, right? Not to read it a history, because Abraham existed, Isaac existed, Jacob existed, but they came in order to show us the archetype, the prototype that they represent. And this is what Moses wrote in the Torah, mathematically, because he said, begins with Abraham, as you see. These are the creations of Abraham, meaning Mathematically, read it and you will understand what I am talking about, says Moses in the Torah. But people read it literally and they just remember those patriarchs as the Christians. Master Jesus of Nazareth, Master of Aramento, brought the doctrine of that beautiful archetype from Uranus, which incarnates in the Adam Harishon in order to keep ahead in the development. And people didn't understand. They think that Jesus, the personality of Jesus, the master that came 2,000 years ago, will appear in heaven eventually again and take all the people that believe in, in him to heaven. And that's ludicrous. How are we going? It's flesh and blood, says the master Hilarion, doesn't inherit the kingdom of God. It is very clear. But people are still there. They want to be with a rotten body in heaven. And that's sad. So that's why we are not afraid of death. Because that's why we're born here in this physical world, to die. But before dying, let us work. In order to take something really valuable into our psyche. At least in the first level, the psyche cause, the psyche cause bodies.
Thank you very much. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all